Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Double murder rocks Soho community in St. Thomas. Plus, more reaction to the imposition of states of emergency. And later in sports, reggae boys hunt win on World Cup qualification and machine masters. Here are the details. Another St. Thomas community has been rocked by a double murder. The latest incident took place in Soho early this morning. It's why one councillor is pleading with the police to do more to curb crime in the parish. Sandra Williams reports. Less than a week, St. Thomas has recorded two double murders. About 2.30 Tuesday morning, 22-year-old Armando Grant, otherwise called DJ Arkili, and his 23-year-old girlfriend, Julina Grant, were murdered on Top Hill Road in Soho. Armando was unemployed and from a Middleton address, while Julina, also unemployed, was from Top Hill District. According to police reports, the two were asleep inside Julina's one-bedroom board structure when gunmen kicked in the door before shooting them several times, killing them. It's understood that Armando was a suspect in the murder at Bump District a few weeks ago. However, the motive behind the killings is not yet known. Councillor for the Seaforth Division in which Soho Falls, Joan Spencer, says the police do not have a grip on crime in the parish. The police were in Whitehall last night with a meeting begging the citizen to cooperate with them. And after the police left, we have a double murder. That is showing that nothing is happening. The police cannot control, cannot control the murder that is happening in this division, which is a country area. We should be a quiet here. We start to see a level of, of crime just going up, skyrocketing. Just last week, gunmen posing as police murdered two men in Bull Bay. It's not clear if these latest killings are connected. Mrs. Spencer says this latest incident has increased unsolved murders in the parish since the start of the year to nine. So I'm calling on the police to do much more. They must can do something more. Go into the community and do community policing. Talk to the citizens to find out what is happening. Because people in the area know what is happening. You know, They know everything, but they refuse to talk. So some policemen and women must have some confidence. Let the citizens have confidence in some of them that they can tell them what is really happening. I'm tired of it. It's really tired. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. And a man was last night killed by residents in Rocky Point, Clarendon, after he reported he attacked a family with a gun during a burglary. The gun taken from the man was handed over to the police. It's reported that sometime after 8 o'clock, members of a family returned home to find their house being ransacked by a man armed with a gun. He reported he opened fire at them. A struggle ensued. The family members called for help from residents who responded and proceeded to beat the man, causing serious injuries. He was later pronounced dead at hospital. His identity is not known. The body of a man was found this morning in a canal along Featherbed Lane in Spanish Town, St. Catherine. The identity of the dead man is not yet known. About 7 o'clock, passers-by stumbled on the body laying face down in a pool of water in the canal. The man sported a dreadlock hairstyle and a knapsack and was clad in a white t-shirt and black shorts. The police were alerted to the scene. Now, according to the police, there were no signs of physical altercation. A post-mortem is to be conducted to determine the cause of death. The president of the Cornwall Bar Association continues to raise concern about the SOE in St. James. In an interview with our news team yesterday, the attorney questioned whether the detention facilities were adequate. Presently, the Barnet Street Police Station is used as a quarantine site for detainees. So they are kept at Barnet Street for a period of 14 days. Thereafter, they are transferred to the Montego Bay Police Station. The question is, where will persons be detained uh, once they are held by the police under the state of emergency? Will they be kept at Barn Street as well and then transferred to the Montego Bay Police Station? Do we have adequate facilities to deal with that? Are they going to be placed under a makeshift tent or shed at the Freeport Police Station like what was done previously? During previous days of emergency in the parish, there were issues surrounding the detention of citizens without them being charged. 
the issue is again being raised. Accompanied by the announcing of a state of emergency, it indicated that the parish judge did not have the power to hear cases concerning persons detained under the state of emergency unless that person has been in custody for a period of 90 days or more. What is the period now? Does a parish judge have the power to hear matters concerning a detainee before the expiration of 90 days? How are we going to operate? Um, is of great concern to us. To a TVJ News follow-up now, six months after TVJ News reported a public health crisis at the Glengough Police Station in St. Catherine, very little has been done to address the issue. Stakeholders in the area say the rodent and termite infestation and poor toilet facilities have gotten worse. But as Kalisha Williams reports, the JCF Property Management Division said work should begin before the end of the financial year. The Glen Gough Police Station in St. Catherine on May 18, 2021. An eyesore. Six months later and all that has been done is the painting of the guard room. Everything else remains the same or even worse. And just a little painting is an insult to the policemen who work at, work at the police station. For instance, the termites continue to eat away doors, walls, and the floorboards, leaving gaping holes and what appears to be rat burrows. The toilet is still broken, and now the walls and window panes have corroded. Obviously, it is a, it's a health risk. And the, 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 the rats, I think they are, they are still here. And nothing is being done about this police station. Absolutely nothing. It's just nasty. And, and this is the only police station in my division, Glengarth Police Station. And I'm not, I'm not going to remain silent about this issue at all. We were showed this document bearing the name of the Ministry of Health and dated November 12, 2021. It confirmed that rats, roaches and termites are present at the facility and several other health issues which need urgent attention. It's really angering me. The, these police officers are human beings. When, when they are to eat, even at lunch, they have to come out on the veranda. If you look in the, 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 the waiting area, the kitchen, look, just look around the station, inside and outside, the bathrooms. I, 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 I just don't know what is happening. They need to procure some funds to work on the station. How much longer the officers are going to work in this type of inhumane condition? How, how much longer? In June, the security ministry announced that over 15 police stations were to be upgraded by the end of 2021 under its project Rebuild, Overhaul and Construct Rock. When we contacted the ministry, we were told the JCS Property Management Division took responsibility for the Glengough Police Station, which is also under the Rock Initiative. Sergeant Courtney Chambers at the Property Management Division told us his team did an assessment of the police station and a bill of quantity was sent to the procurement department. Sergeant Chambers explained that work should begin at the station before the end of the financial year, which ends April 2022. Kalisha Williams, TVJ News. Back to matters relating to the state of emergency now. The Opposition People's National Party is again blasting the government for the imposition of the seven states of public emergency. At a press conference a short while ago, Opposition leader Mark Golding said that the enhanced security measures have not been yielding the desired results. Mr. Golding says social intervention as well as police and military support can address Jamaica's growing crime problem. We believe in a national program to save at youth risk from turning to badness and the gun. The education system has failed so many of our youths. Invest in them and give them a second chance to become productive citizens. We also believe in the peace management initiative and using community influencers as violence interrupters who are on the ground and can intervene in conflicts and prevent a spiral of reprisal killings. The government has effectively abandoned the PMI. We will build it back. The opposition leader says crafting, amending and reviewing laws to plug loopholes to convict criminals should be prioritized as well. Where is the overhaul of the Firearms Act? Where is the legislation to bring new and enhanced security measures to provide an efficient mechanism 
for enhanced surveillance of dangerous suspects? Where are the tracking devices for alleged sex offenders and other violent criminals who are granted bail? We've been hearing about these things for years now, but the government has dropped the ball in each instance. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. 30 new cases of COVID-19 were reported in Jamaica on Monday. The cases were confirmed from 645 test samples, resulting in a positivity rate of 4.9%. The country's overall case count now stands at 90,341. The Ministry of Health says two more persons have died from the virus. This has increased the death toll to 2,331. In the meantime, 204 COVID-19 patients remain hospitalized. 14 are in critical condition, while 31 are severely ill. 177 more people have recovered from the virus pushing the overall recovery count to 61,024. The vaccination efforts of the health ministry is being thwarted by, particularly cat by particular categories of public health employees who have been discouraging persons at vaccination sites from getting inoculated. This was revealed by President of the Jamaica Medical Doctors Association, JMDA, Dr. Mindy Fitzhenley. A 60% vaccination target for the island could be in jeopardy. President of the JMDA, Dr. Mindy Fitzhenley, is raising concern that people are being discouraged from taking the COVID-19 vaccines at vaccination sites. She did not want to name the categories of public health employees who are discouraging people as she argued that doing so could affect other members of a medical team working at vaccination sites. We've even heard reports of giving them information how to get a fake vaccination card, and that's something that we take very seriously, and that's why it was elevated to the level of the Honorable Minister so that he could be aware of the situation. As you know, we are in a pandemic. We have been working tirelessly on the front line for over 18 months at this point in time, and so we're going to do everything we can for the public health of the country as well as for each individual. She says the incidents were reported to the Ministry of Health over several months, culminating in a warning from Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton. Dr. Tufton argued that action will be taken against employees found to be undermining the COVID-19 vaccination program. In the meantime, the Nurses Association of Jamaica, NAJ, says it has not received a formal report of healthcare workers trying to dissuade persons from getting vaccinated. However, the association's president has cautioned healthcare workers to ensure that their advice to patients is evidence-based. We do believe that personal opinions should not come into care. And we understand that vaccines have over the years been a form of protection for the entire populace and while there may be those who have their personal opinion in the nursing profession, we know that our personal opinions do not come first. It is the science and evidence-based information which we as nurses put out there. On Monday, our news center reported that Dr. Tufton wrote to senior officials in the public health sector on November 10, indicating that an investigation was underway into reports of employees advocating against COVID-19 vaccination. The health minister said that this was tantamount to sabotaging the government's COVID-19 policies and programs. The letter stated that this was a serious infraction, which would be in breach of staff orders for the public service. 17 special needs students who attend the Adonajai group of schools in St. Andrew have been displaced following a dispute between administrators and the Ministry of Education over unpaid fees. It's reported that students were barred from classes as the school communicated to parents that its finances had been in the red since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. They said the government also failed to pay teachers on time. The first academic year, we waited seven months to get payment. And the payment that we get was it was not able to even fund the program, specifically a special needs program, because as Mr. Williams outlined, we do not only offer the educational component. 
Leighton Williams is a parent of a child who suffers from autism. He has since described the ministry's decision to relocate the students as callous. His child was pulled from the Waltham Park Road-based institution and placed at One Way Preparatory School on Newark Avenue in Kingston. The ministry has dealt with it in a very callous and high-handed manner. There has been no real communication with the parents. They have, ju they have just summarily dragged them out of the school or pulled them out of the school, dumped them elsewhere, and that's it. Special educator Carol Narcisse says based on the nature of the situation, relocating the students would create more harm than good. Negotiating change and adjusting to change is often very disruptive and traumatic for, for children with special needs. And so it has to be handled in a way that um, is the least disruptive as, as the adults can make it. Another concern she's raising is the status of the facility the students have been relocated to. So any school that is asked to take students with special needs is obligated, morally obligated, to ensure that it can provide these multiple ways of, of um, serving the child. So it must be very challenging for a school um, required to provide multiple services to meet the needs of students, but not know where the wherewithal is coming from. The issue was discussed on the morning agenda on Power 106 FM. Javon Keyes, TVJ News. It's now time for the Business Minute. In the world of business, Jamaica's total spending on imports and earnings from exports increased during the January to July period. The Statistical Institute of Jamaica Statin says imports amounted to 3 billion US dollars, a 19% increase from 2.7 billion US dollars during the same period in 2020. This was mainly due to higher import costs for fuels and lubricants. Meanwhile, Jamaica earned 908 million US dollars from exports, which were 24% higher than last year. And in business internationally, natural gas prices in Europe soared by 10% Tuesday after Germany confirmed that it has suspended the process of certifying a controversial new Russian gas pipeline called Nord Stream 2. The German energy market regulator said in a statement that it could not certify Nord Stream 2 as an independent operator because the company was based in Switzerland, not Germany. Leading energy traders have warned of the risk of rolling blackouts in Europe in the event of a colder than average winter. The German decision comes at a time of rising tension between the European Union and Russia over Ukraine and a migrant crisis on the Belarus-Poland border. The European Union gets about 40% of its natural gas from Russia. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Cody Ann Barrett. It's now time for the top regional and international stories with Sandy Williams. In the region, the Guyana-based Caribbean Community CARICOM Secretariat says a new regional program aimed at helping students recover the learning losses of the COVID-19 era will be presented to the public on Thursday. CARICOM said the Learning Recovery and Enhancement Program for Caribbean Schools was established to assist educators with facilitating the learning recovery needed by students whose education has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The program was developed through collaboration involving the Barbados-based Caribbean Development Bank, the CARICOM Secretariat, and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Commission. On the international scene, Two explosions have rocked the Ugandan capital of Kampala. At least three people believed to be police officers were killed, according to a journalist on the scene who witnessed the carnage. 27 other officers were injured. The first blast went off near the central police station and the second moments after outside Uganda's parliament. A third device was found later and detonated by the bomb squad. The cause of the explosions is not yet known. No group has claimed responsibility. And those were the top regional and international stories. I'm Sandy Williams. And we head to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your midday sports report. Renato Brown is here. Welcome back. It's now time for your midday sports. 
It's expected to be an emotional day for the Reggae Boys as they face the United States in a crucial World Cup qualifier at the National Stadium this evening at 5. Today marks 24 years to the day that the Reggae Boys qualified to their only senior men's FIFA World Cup finals in 1997. It also marks the return of spectators inside the National Stadium, with 5,000 fully vaccinated fans allowed to be a part of the occasion for the first time since the start of the World Cup qualifiers. But most importantly, today could see the Reggae Boys slip further from qualification should they lose to the U.S. Head coach Theodore Whitmore, who was a member of the historic team two decades ago, knows the importance of this evening's fixture. We have to get three points and it, it doesn't really matter who is out there. We just have to, as I said before, we just have to execute. We have to do what we need to be done uh, and that's going to be the, the importance. The USA will be without midfielder Weston McKinney and centre-back Miles Robinson due to card suspensions. Meanwhile, the Reggae Boys will be hoping El Salvador gain a draw way to Panama in their contest at 8.05 p.m. Currently, the sixth-place Reggae Boys are on six points, the same as El Salvador in seventh, with both teams five points behind Panama, who are in fourth and a World Cup playoff spot. Bottom place Honduras could also do the Reggae Boys a favor should they manage to avoid defeat against Costa Rica, who are also on six points. In the other game, second place Mexico will face third place Panama also at 9.05. In cricket, the West Indies and the USA will co-host the 2024 ICC T20 World Cup. This will be the West Indies' third time hosting an ICC World Tournament following the 2010 T20 World Cup and the 2007 50 over World Cup. While it will mark the first major cricket tournament the USA will host. Meanwhile, cricket's world governing body, the ICC, has confirmed the host countries for each of the next eight global events between 2024 and 2031, a period which includes four T20 World Cups, two Champions Trophies and two ODI World Cups. And finally, Manchester City defender Benjamin Mendy has been charged with two further counts of rape. Mendy has been summoned to appear at Stockport Magistrates Court on Wednesday. The 27-year-old footballer who remains in custody is now facing six counts of rape and one count of sexual assault. The charges relate to four complaints over the age of 16 and are alleged to have taken place between October 2020 and August 2021. And that's it for your midday sports report. O'Shane, it's back to you. Thanks, Donata. Just before we go, though, um, with Western and Myers Robinson out of the USA squad, what are the possibilities for the Reggae Boys? It, we have a, a greater possibility of winning, but it will be tough. It will, it's the United States. They're a tough team. They're coming off a win against Mexico. And uh, look, it's 24 years to the day since we last <laughs> qualified. If that can't G up the Reggae Boys, then I don't know what can. And 5,000 fans? 5,000 fans should go a long way in helping the team get a victory, but we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Renardo. And that's the Midday News. I'm Shane Masters. Join us at 7 for primetime news on behalf of the news, sports and production teams. Good afternoon.